Welcome, everybody, to the Living Your Career Show. My name is Roisin Duffy. Uh, I am a director of Blue Sky Careers. We are a recruitment and career advisory agency. The theme of our show today is, are ethical foundations more important uh, or, str- or perhaps more important than strong values? And we have a very special guest, and her name is Carolyn Varley. Carolyn is a mother of two fabulous girls. She's a journalist. She's an educator. She's an executive with national and international experience. Uh, she's worked in Europe and Southeast Asia. She holds a master in business in journalism from QUT, and she specialized in ethics. She has uh, co-produced uh, a journalism textbook, which I imagine, Carolyn, was a labor of love. She is a former government and university communication leader. She is the current director of communication and engagement Haitian and engagement at the Queensland Mental Health Commission. Her passion is ethical leadership. And I can't tell you how pleased we are to have you today, Carolyn. Thanks for coming and spending some time with us. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess the first thing, Carolyn, you know, we've talked about this before, and, and I know, you know, you hold, you know, your values and, and, and your ethical approach uppermost in everything that you do. Why, you know... I guess are ethical foundations more important than strong values? Why do you think they are? Well, I think anyone can have strong values. It doesn't mean that their values are um, in the least bit uh, useful. I would say that we can look around some of the world leaders that we've got at the moment and uh, look at their values. and They hold their values very strongly. I think their values are totally unethical and immoral, but they do have very strong values. So, no, I would say that an ethical approach is more important than a values-based one, than a values-based one, unless, of course, your values are based on strong ethics. Mm. One of the things I know is very important to you is living an ethical life. Um, and, and I know you to do that in every quarter of your life. What does ethical leadership mean to you, though? Just before I answer that, I don't know that I do live an ethical life in every quarter. I do my best. Um, but, you know, I would be an absolute fraud to suggest that I don't slip up. Of course, I slip up all the time, um, both at work and in my personal life. I think that it's more important to try um, than to actually, well, it would be more important to succeed, but I think that's a, a, a big ask for anybody. Yeah. Um, and now I've completely lost what you asked me. My question was um, <laughs> ethical leadership. What does it mean to you? You know, we've talked about some of the political leaders around the world at the moment. Perhaps they have, they have their own set of values. We may not necessarily agree with them. We may not necessarily agree with them. But I guess it's the ethical standards that we're talking about today. What does it mean to you hmm. to be an ethical leader? So to me, it really means treating everyone fairly. And I mean your um, staff, the, your, your managers, people at all levels of the organisation, the clients, customers, whatever it might be that you're dealing with. But the broader community as well, being aware that what most organisations do has some flow on effect to people that you'll never see, that you might not even see as your stakeholders. Um, And being fair to, yeah, to the community and to the planet, really. I think that's incredibly important for me because that's being fair to future generations. Um, Mm. I guess a big key for me is giving people space to grow. I think that any member who's on your team should be growing and should have that capability to grow all the time. So it's nurturing people, helping them develop. And it's taking pride in it's taking pride in what they do rather than taking credit for what they do. Mm. So for me, a measure of success of my role as a leader is the success and the achievements of the people that I'm working with, both now and in the past, you know, when I was a journalism educator, um, I still come across people who I, I taught years and years ago who tell me that I had some positive and lasting effect on them. And that's a, an amazing reward to be able to hear that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that's that's my idea of ethical leadership. It's leading from within the team um, rather than above it. It's working to bring everyone along. I think one of the things that's important to you is how you were raised. You, I, I think at one point you said to me, Roisin, I've been raised with really good role models. And perhaps you can explain a little bit about how they have influenced you and and who you are today as an ethical leader, today as an ethical leader. 
Oh, look, absolutely. I mean, one of my um, my most powerful role models are, are my parents. Um, my mother in her professional and her private life has always been and continues to be wise, um, far wiser than I could hope to be, fair, um, considerate of other people's needs, and yet manages to get things done. So for me, that's a terrific role model. I, you know, you, you say to people before you jump into a decision, what um, what would your mother or grandmother think about that? We say it to our own kids before they mm. post something on the internet. Mm. Um, for me, that's a that's a guidance for life. What would my mother or my father um, have done in that situation? And would I be happy if my own daughters, who are young adults, if they emulated the sorts of behaviour that I'm um, hoping to model? And I think mm. that's a really high measure of uh, high measure of. Uh, of your, of your own standards. And, I mean, you, you do, you get your ethics from your family, you get your values from your family, from other places as well, depending on mm. the other influences on you. But that's a really strong starting point, isn't it? I guess it's interesting because I think if you are ethical, you almost, you know, it's like your friends and your family, when you're raising your children, you are almost automatically associate with families that almost have the same values as you. It's an interesting one. I, I guess it's an interesting thing for you to, in seeking out, is that a measure when you say you're looking at other people and what they do and your associations, both on a personal and professional level? Um, I guess that ethical radar is something that we really look for in the people that we know and see in terms of their fairness, how they treat others. I guess my question to you is what leaders do you admire and why? When you look around you now at the moment, we're dealing with you know, the political side of things at home and abroad that's, you know, a little bit beige. It hasn't been exactly wonderful in terms of exactly wonderful in terms of a great display of ethics. Um, we look at some of the companies that have had to pay millions um, in terms of, you know, uh, damages to people, perhaps for work that they've um, should or shouldn't have done. Um, I'm interested in what leaders do you admire and why uh, do why do you admire them? Well, the really obvious one for me in the political sphere is Jacinda Ardern. Um, in yes. New Zealand. She's not perfect and she would be the first one to say that she's not perfect but I think the approach that she, she takes to well-being, including having a well-being budget for New Zealand, points out clearly that well-being is far more important than um, continued economic growth um, and that well-being in itself does actually contribute to economic growth. If your community isn't um, isn't healthy and, and doesn't have strong well-being then you're everything else is going to start to crumble around the fringes and we can see that in countries overseas. So please. So I think that she is a, a very clear one. Um, a lot of leaders closer to home, people that I've worked with, mm. and I'm not going to name them here because it would be like thanking all your aunts and uncles at a wedding and missing one. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to take that risk, but I have worked with some fabulous, terrific leaders um, throughout my what career. Do you at ones. Oh, of course. When you look at somebody who's made a decision in a tough time, you know, and I think that's really the sort of the strength of a leader. You know, you've got a pressure point. Uh, it could be controversial. There could be a lot of public scrutiny. What do you look for in that leader when they're making that decision at that point in time? Because I think that's where the pressure really is exerted for mm. people, you know, perhaps to sway a little when it comes to their ethical approach. Yes, and it's where I think any of us are at risk of falling down. But if they are, if they are conducting their life with a strong ethical framework, um, what some would call a values-based framework, then it's it's almost habitual, isn't it? And when they come to making those decisions, they will um, will apply that framework to it. I think also, you know, when it comes to the really pointy end. Good leaders take advice from those around them. They don't make decisions on their own. Well, they do make the decision because in the end it's their decision and they have to um, bear the consequences of it. But they do that in consultation with people whose advice they value, um, mm. including people who have views different to their own because it's, it's mm. so important to be able to seek the counterpoints. If we go down this path, what are the risks? What are the unintended consequences that, that we could lead to? So th there's got to be a lot of logic and uh, and a good framework behind it. Mm. Um, I suppose we talk about, um, you know, you recruit a lot of teams. You've had recruit a lot of teams. You've had, you know, 
ginormous teams throughout the state, and then equally you've had smaller teams. Is there something for you in particular when you're interviewing somebody or reviewing an application? And I know this is a, a sort of an outside the box sort of question, but this is about careers. And, you know, some people um, hold their values very true to themselves. We talk about um, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about if you're going to apply for a role, work for a company that culturally aligns with you, work for values based leadership. You know, if you hold something dear, make sure you seek that out in your applications and in, in, in the jobs that you pursue and the careers that you develop. What do you look for when you're looking at an application? What do you see and seek when you're interviewing somebody when it comes to the whole ethical piece? Mm. Well, I, I think that alignment is so important. So I want to understand why their their whole life approach, how how it can align with the organisation organisation um, that they're looking to work in. I want them to be able to. I want them to be hungry, Rasheen. I want people who are really willing to learn, no matter what. You know, I mean, I I hope that I learn something new every single day. And it would be a bit disappointing to have a day where you think you get together and you think, oh, I don't think I actually broadened my knowledge or skills at all today. So I want people that are always hungry to learn, but that are happy to do that in a uh, a cooperative, collaborative environment. I don't mm. want solo players anywhere. You know, I don't think that they're very useful. Mm. You know, um, I suppose people working, so this, this is the other side of that question, really. You, in this current market, times are tough and people may be forced to take positions that perhaps aren't exactly their ideal role or it could be a role or it could be a stepping stone to something. There are so many different ways of looking at why do I take this job? How does it benefit me? How does it benefit my learning? How does it benefit my progression? But I guess the question is that if you find yourself in a workplace that is not in keeping with your values. I guess, what advice would you give to young people when they're facing perhaps some of those ethical conundrums? What would mm. you say to them? Yeah, and uh, it's so true, isn't it? You can't always choose. You can't always have your dream job. And you will, during your career, find yourself in jobs that really have the potential to make you miserable, but you can't mm. not be there because you kind of need to feed yourself and your family. Yeah, um, absolutely. In those circumstances, I think that you, you need to, to take the pulse of the people to whom you're reporting, to take the pulse of the organisation and wherever possible give frank and fearless advice where you think that it's appropriate. You know, if you see something that you think, you know, if you see something that you think is damaging people, damaging the country, the company, um, that's not useful, then hopefully you can call it out. Obviously in some companies that's not going to be an opportunity and with some leaders that's not not a possibility either. I think in those cases you learn everything you can from the company while, the, while you're there from the role and you're also at the same time looking around to find something that aligns with you better. But don't get bogged down to the point where you're so miserable in a job that you can't see that it's going to offer you anything. If you're stuck mm. there, learn while you're there. I think there's always that thing when you're coming up through the ranks and you sort of feel like, and, you know, this is looking at managers and leaders. There are things that you see that are happening that you don't particularly approve of. And I think there is that fear. I think with ethics comes a level of fear. The people are actually concerned. If I open my mouth, that's me. I'm finished. Me, I'm finished. Mm. And I'm just wondering how people can broach those conversations without putting it all on the line. You know, you're saying, obviously, in your heart, it doesn't take much to figure out if you're coming to work of a day and you don't want to go there and you feel compromised in that work. You know, not everybody has the opportunity to walk away, but that would be the plan. But if you felt that you should say something, if you felt, you know, how many young people do you and I know and people coming through the ranks and they're, they're at work and they have this sense of, um, gosh, I really don't agree with this. This is not good. And... Um, but it's that thing that, you know, it, it, it's a top-down culture. And if you say something, you're suddenly being obstructive or you're being awkward or you're being too fixed or, you know, all those certain attributes. Mm. You know, there's a certain style of leadership when people start to sort of front up and say, I'm not comfortable with this. There's a certain style of leadership 
that will push you down pretty quickly, push you down pretty quickly, and push you to the side even more quickly. My question to you is, how would you broach? I mean, your, your first, if it's a good company generally, you could just find yourself in a bad function. If, you know, how would you broach, if you were giving advice to young people out there that find themselves in that situation, what sort of strategies do you think would be useful them, for them to use before they decide, I need to move because this isn't good for me? Mm. That's interesting. If I don't move, the lights go up, just as you say, <laughs> I need to move. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we can still see you, though, perfectly fine. Look, I, I think this is where um, having a good mentor is so important. Whether your mentor is within your organisation or outside it, you need someone where you can have a conversation that's removed from the actual, you know, what's actually happening in the workplace to say, look, this is my view, this is what I'm seeing. It seems to me like there's a real problem here. There's a real problem here. Um, what do you think? And unpack that with a mentor who you trust and who who's hopefully um, values align, ethics align with your own, um, and get somebody else to help work it out. And particularly for young people, when you come into those toxic workplaces and you're, you have no choice but to be there, there's no way you can work that all out by yourself. So call for help. You know, it might be... It might be parents, it might be family members, it might be, you know, people in other professions. If you can get a good mentoring relationship going early in your career, it will be invaluable to you right throughout. Mm. I think the other thing is too, Carolyn, when you're having that conversation, you know, it's easy to be emotional when it comes to our values and when it comes to our ethics. But I, I think, you know, you have to have the facts and the data at your disposal. Whatever you're saying, I think, has to be objective. I mean, mm. you know, we're not going to go into specific situations today because specific situations today because that's not what this is about. It's about guidance and counsel. Um, I think we see enough of that played out in the papers and on the news. But I guess if you were talking to somebody about how they might stack up that argument. So the first thing is talking to a mentor. The mentor will hopefully, as you say, be aligned with you. But what tools and strategies have you found useful when you're trying to say, look, I think if you go down this path, this is where we might end up, whereas, the, you know, these are the facts. What sort of strategies and tools have you used perhaps to broach some of those conversations? Mm -hmm. I think that the first question, and it's a question to um, or uh, something to consider for yourself before you even start conversations is don't take it personally. I think often things happen to us in the workplace and we take it personally. And if we continue to take it personally and realise that it's don't realise that it's got nothing to do with us, it's to do with other people, then that can drive us down and grind us to a powder very quick, grind us to a powder very quickly. So I'd say don't take it personally, but then you really need to look at the pros and cons of any situation. I mean, if there's something happening and you're concerned about it, do you think it's illegal? Do you think it's unethical? Well, in that case, maybe it's time to think about being some sort of whistleblower, but that takes a lot of consideration because that can be career destroying. And um, has a lot of repercussions, as we've absolutely. seen with those that were whistleblowers. I mean, absolutely. that is like, that is such, that is such a vulnerable place to put yourself in. It really and is. Um, you have to see that as your last resort. Or... Of, or whatever is happening is so egregious that it just has to stop. Um, and, you know, sometimes you do see people that literally have to, well, physically, figuratively, have to throw themselves under the bus to stop something awful happening. But that does occur. But mm. failing that, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of tools out there, and I'd go back to something like um, uh, the Potter box that helps you work out, box that helps you work out in various quadrants where you think things are, are sitting and what the what the issues might be it might just be writing yourself a list of pros and cons on a, a a piece of paper consulting with other people who might have been in similar situations before um reading up um yeah but there's no simple one answer definitely i think also you know we talked about a while ago you know you talked about a toxic culture and i sometimes think think the the ethics of leadership determines the culture of an organization. Totally. And um, I'd just be interested in your comments on that because, again, many people are lured into this blue chip, sophisticated HR, tons of progress, great remuneration, 
you know, and some companies are like that, but the function you're in could be a dodgy one. You know, you could just have the bad, you could just have that leader or that manager who's not all that they're cut out to be, they're cut out to be. But I'd just be very interested in your thoughts about, again, people looking for work, looking to progress in work, people being stuck in roles where perhaps they're not altogether too happy, as you described earlier. What do you think are the links to ethics and culture? And how is that apparent to you when you see that it's probably not all that it could be or should be? Mm. No, certainly in an organisation, it does stop at the, it starts at the top and it flows through. Um, in a good organisation, there's opportunities for it to flow through from all levels, but in toxic organisations, it's generally top down, giving permission to others throughout the organisation to behave equally as badly. Um, so the, the sorts of things that flow through, I mean, often it's, it, it goes back into the history of the organisation. Um, and it's become so, so much part of the culture that it's never going to change and you're not going to change it. I guess, I guess it comes back to why you're in the organisation and if you're hunting those really lucrative jobs, which can be pretty enticing, particularly when you're young, then, yeah, you might end up in a job that just doesn't align for you that over time even corrupts your own ethics and values. Mm. Um, you have to make that decision. Is that where you want to be? Some people or could do, go the other way. Right. Yeah. Or in fact could go yeah. the other way and you mature to a point that you said this simply isn't acceptable. Yep, I've outgrown um, You studied a Master of Journalism and your specialisation was ethics. And I know you've held that true in your career all the way or strove. You've, you've really done everything possible to try to hold that close to you. I guess the question is what were the three things you've learned about ethics from those studies and the three things you take with you today. And I'm thinking in particular of people who are studying, what sort of courses they would study, mm. what sort of, um, what mm. sort of um, that would align with their values, not just the work that they do, but the, the lines of study that they pursue as well. You obviously pursue that for um, a reason that was valuable for you. What were the three things you took out of those studies? Look, let me tell you why I um, did a master's in journalism ethics. It was because I was working in an organisation where I saw examples, not right across the organisation, but I saw specific examples where ethics were, it, it was a black hole. It was, mm. you know, anti-ethical, if that can be such a thing. Um, and I was at a level where I pulled up with it, went along with it to some extent for a time, and then I got to the point where I, had, I just said, I, I can't do this, but I need to restore my faith. Um, in journalism, pretty much, and um, and that's why I went off and did that that masters, and it took me off on different paths that I hadn't even imagined at the time. Imagined at the time, um, the three things that you do. Wow, I mean, whatever you pursue, for me, pursue something that you love, because we spend so much of our lives at work, and it influences every waking minute of our day and often the sleeping ones um yeah pursue what you love i guess the other question is if you could give advice to leaders today we live in a very uncertain and unpredictable world right now there's a lot of talk about you know um, government departments and perhaps some of that top-down management and and how people are feeling uh, you know, we've had seen widespread cuts in the university where you used to work in the commercial sector. You know, there's a lot of people that are struggling today. And I guess, you know, we talk about leaders needing to be commercial, but they need to also demonstrate, as somebody said to me, as somebody said to me, the avocado core, they need to be soft internally. You know, they need to be able to show that they care about people. You know, you can be, I guess you can be soft on the outside and you can be tough on the inside. My question to you is, if you were advising leaders today um, on how to be ethical, how to think about the world we live in today, what would be your key message to them? What are you going to leave as a legacy for the people that are coming along behind in, you know, five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? What are, what are we going to leave behind for them? And that's in terms of community, in terms of culture, in terms of environment altogether so yeah what what are you doing to help your kids or their kids or their kids and what sort of world do you want them to live in and model that mm. 
model mm. it now and listen to people, find out what they want and expect too because it's not personal, it's not all about you. Mm, that's absolutely right. And then there's, uh, I guess, and then there's, uh, I guess the final question is really young people, um, people who are in the midst of their careers, people who are approaching retirement, many, many people, you know, COVID-19 has been unsympathetic to all and sundry. And we're approaching Christmas now, and then we're going to come into the new year. And I always call that the just off the CV time. Uh, I guess my question to you is from an ethical perspective, um, from a career perspective, from a job hunting perspective, is there one message that you would give these people that they could make their own that might help them in terms of their, I guess, strength and resilience and, and methods and means over the coming weeks and months? Mm. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because there's no one message for all people. I mean, for most people in Australia, I would say most of us are incredibly and ridiculously lucky even now. Mm. Um, even mm. if we've lost our jobs and we have something to to fall back or something to to fall back on, Rasheen, you and I have spoken about the plight of um, refugees in Australia who have nothing to fall back on. Absolutely, so, you know, we yeah. we are most of us are incredibly fortunate. So don't forget that. Don't um, don't subside into misery if you can possibly avoid it. Sometimes you have to let yourself plunge down into a bit of misery, but make sure you can see the light and come on out again. Um, yeah, what 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 is it that you can do that can contribute to society through your job and through other measures as well? You know, and if people are out of work at the moment, my God, there are so many volunteer opportunities out there at the moment to help others and at the same time develop your own skills and develop yourself as a person. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, there are so many TAFE courses available now. There is mm. mention of their usual cost. Um, there are... So many, I think, you know, apprentices, uh, traineeships, you know, if you want to go to university, you know, if you want to go to university, God knows, you know, our tutors need to be working. And Carolyn, you want know what, I mean, you know what the university sector is like right now, you know, across the world and here in Australia, you know, it's going to take a while before normality comes back and our international students come back and we're back to some, some, some semblance of normality. Mm, if ever, if ever, I don't know that we'll ever return to what we were. Mm. But, um, but I, you know, that I think that um, the pandemics have certainly exposed a lot of weaknesses that were already there in, in workplaces and in society. And um, those of us that are fortunate enough to be able to sort of try to uh, contribute towards some repair work there need to do that. Gosh, I sound And I think that, that's I? on that. Well, not really. I think we're at that point where, you know, the world is considerably changed. Our own communities are considerably changed. Communities are considerably changed. The corporate and government sector, as we know it, is considerably changed. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, today I thought today's session with you was, was very timely because this is a period for leaders to take stock and to understand, you know, what fair, equitable, consistent leadership looks like. And to think about that as we approach 2021 and the challenges that we're facing 2021, to actually start thinking about who they are, what they are, and the value that they can bring, not just to the companies they work for, but the people that work for them, the broader stakeholders and community. Carolyn Varley, I just want to tell you, you are a wise lady, and it's an absolute pleasure to spend time with you today. So thank you very much. Um, I think there is much for people to take on board and learn from today's conversation. And you and I will be revisiting other things in the future, but I'm very, very happy to have you on board. To everybody else who's been listening to our show today, um, tune in, um, tune in, take some note. Hope some of this will help you. Um, the Living Your Career show airs every Tuesday and Thursday at 12 o'clock. We have some fabulous guests for you to listen to. Um, Carolyn, thank you. I really appreciate your time today and um, and we'll be talking soon. My pleasure, Roisin. I can't wait to see who might um, come out of the woodwork to tell you or me that I have behaved in ways that are unethical to them because, you know, I do have a, I've spoken to you, a fair degree of imposter syndrome about this type of thing, but all we can do is try to do our best, yeah? You said to me, Roisin, I always strive. I try to be self-aware and I try to do what's right for people. And I think, you know, that's probably not a bad value system to start with. And um, look at where you are today. Um, plenty of credibility, lady. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.